reading from the prophet Isaiah. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall, not, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he, for he has glorified you. This happens to me more than I want to admit. I can't find something. I look for it, but I can't find it, okay? Maybe a shirt in the closet, it may be a can of soup in the pantry, it may be a book on a shelf. I look for it, it's there, I know it's there, I can't find it. The worst is when Kim asked me to get something for her, I look, and I can't find it. She tells me where to look, I still can't see it. Exasperated at my incompetence, she comes into the room and she goes right for it. It was there all along, but I didn't see it. Anyone else resemble that remark? <laughs> so what's the problem? If you ask Kim, it's the difference between seeking and seeing. Uh, I was looking but not seeing because my mind wasn't attentive to what I was doing. This is a common problem for me with everyday things. Ask me about the problem of evil? I'll get right on that, don't you know? But looking for something ordinary, hmm, not so much. Kim doesn't just look, she seeks. And because she seeks, she sees. Seek and you shall find, Jesus says. Seek the Lord while he may be found, Isaiah says. Seeing takes effort, and effort seems to us to be the opposite of grace. But is it? Our theme for Lent this year is the grace of seeing. It comes from a poem by J. Philip Newell that you have printed at the top of your order of worship all during this season. I watch for your light, O God, in the eyes of every living creature and in the ever-living flame of my own soul. If the grace of seeing were mine this day, I would glimpse you in all that lives. Grant me the grace of seeing this day. Grant me the grace of seeing. Notice how in these beautiful words, he expects the grace of seeing to be the answer to his prayer, but he doesn't expect it to come to him without his first watching for God's light in, the ever, in every living creature and in the ever-living flame of his own soul. We experience grace with effort, not without it. It isn't merely the product of what we do, but it doesn't come about without our effort at all. Think of it this way. A scientist, we say, discovers something, right? A scientist looks deep into the nature of the world and discovers a truth, but not without first looking intently into a microscope or a telescope, right? What the scientist sees may be exactly what she expected, or it may surprise her, have surprised her. But either way, 
It is a gift of seeing that comes because of intentional seeking. Reinhold Niebuhr was one of the most influential pastors and theologians of the 20th century. He spoke once at Harvard in the 1950s and talked about this relationship between grace and effort, and he likened it to a figure skater. You know, by the time we see a a figure skater on the ice in a competition like the Olympics, that, that, that doing these graceful, amazing things, the triple axles and the spins to the music and all of that, that looks so effortless, there was an awful lot of effort that went into preparing for that graceful moment. In fact, in years past, before they changed the rules, the figure skating competition required, before you could do the freestyle competition that we all see, there was what was called the compulsories, remember? That is where they had to pass the test of painstakingly cutting figure eights and other figures into the ice and proving that they had mastered the balance of the craft before they could move into the freestyle competition. The spiritual life is like this. If we are to grow in grace, we have to put ourselves in position to experience God's grace. We have to answer the call to come to God, to see God by seeking God. When we pick up the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55, he is calling on the people of Israel to come to the waters of Zion, to come to the feast that is being prepared. They are on the cusp of leaving Babylon where they have been in exile for 70 years. They have settled down in exile. They've become comfortable, but there has been a secret unmet longing of their soul all along to go back to their homeland, a longing for home where they could be autonomous again in their own nation, where they could move about and experience the grace of God without worrying about who was in charge of them. And God promises that they will be a nation again, and, and other nations will envy them and want to be drawn to them. But to do so, they have to do something first. They have to move. They have to act. The first verses reflect an ancient custom that happens when a new king would take the throne. The king would cancel everyone's debts and throw a big banquet. And everyone was invited to come and eat and drink with the king. Didn't have to pay for it. You paid just by your presence, by wanting to be there. You didn't need money. The feast was provided for you. Just come and be in the presence of the king and enjoy that feast. But you had to come to the table. Reminds me of the story of the couple who saved all their lives for retirement. When the time finally arrived, they decided to take a cruise to celebrate. For the first few days in the cruise, when it came dinner time, they sat in their stateroom and ate cheese and crackers. But then they met the captain on deck one day, and he invited them to come and eat at his table that night and they sheepishly declined, and finally he cajoled them enough that they confessed that they had only enough money to pay for the ticket itself. They didn't have money for those expensive meals on board the ship. At which point, of course, the captain said, your ticket is all-inclusive. All the food is provided. You just have to come to the table and order whatever your heart desires but they hadn't read the fine prints all the way through. And too many of us are like that. We don't understand that God provides for us everything we need and everything our heart desires. All we have to do is show up to come and sit and eat and enjoy and be present. 
But even if we do come, the food is not the point itself. It's the one who provides it. Return to the Lord, Isaiah says. Not just come to the table and enjoy the blessings God provides. Come feast upon your relationship to God. Come learn the deeper truths about life that food symbolizes but doesn't satisfy. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and labor for that which does not satisfy, he says? Isaiah is telling the people to go deeper, not just to see the food, but to see through it, to see God, the giver of all good things. This is as relevant today as ever. How many of us think that food and drink, cars and houses, schools and country clubs are the point of a good life? We spend our money on things that don't satisfy. And in fact, often they create more obligations. We have to work then to maintain this lifestyle. And then the things we have have us. The point is not these things. The point is what these things point to. We don't have to become monks and nuns, renouncing all earthly comforts in order to find God. God actually made the earth and all that is in it and wants us to enjoy it. Come eat rich foods, but not for its own sake. God wants us to see God through it, to find what is important. The Irish rock band U2 probably wrote the anthem of our generation, this plaintive ballad that begins like this, I have climbed the highest mountains, I have run through the fields, only to be with you. I have run, I have crawled, I have scaled these city walls, only to be with you, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for goes on like that for several more stanzas, always ending the same way. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. It's a spiritual song, clearly directed toward God, talks about the deeper hunger of our souls, the desire to know that filling of our hearts that's more than the filling of our bellies, our highest hopes, more than our smaller ambitions. In a church like ours, we run the risk of celebrating the gifts of God and not celebrating the gift of God. We have so much, and we come to church, or we don't, and we don't We don't recognize the consequence to our souls either way. We're so busy. You know, I sent you an email this week in a church engagement survey. Um, Some of you have filled it out. A lot more of you should. Some of you don't want to because it feels judgy, you know. But see, we're not really measuring your engagement with us so much as we're trying to find out how engaged you are with God. And we do believe that the more engaged you are in worship and in Bible study and in service and in giving and all these things, you'll find God there, not just those things. Too many of us, you know, we... We're, we, we have an attitude about the spiritual life, sort of like the person who doesn't read the Bible, but it's like the Apple terms of service, you know, instead of reading it, you just scroll down and push, I agree. That's not really engagement with God, you know. When I was a kid, 13 or 14 maybe, My parents sent me to a basketball camp in upstate New York run by the former uh, Dallas Mavericks general manager, Norm Sanju. 
Several NBA players were there. I had a blast. It was just so much fun. I was learning a lot about myself. I enjoyed the kids that I was playing with and all of that. And my parents came to see me uh, toward the end of the week. It was their anniversary, uh, July 4th. Uh, my father told my mother that they had to get married on the 4th of July so that he would never forget their anniversary. <laughs> if any of you knew my father, you understand, right? Anyway, they came to see me on their anniversary, right? And they wanted to see how I was doing and to watch me play and all of that. And I was ready to make my pitch to them because I was having so much fun, I wanted to stay another week, right? But when they came and were hanging around and wanted to see me and all of that, I was like not so much ready to hang out with them. I, you know, it was too cool for school. I was you know, I wanted to be with my friends, and they were, you know, older and parents, you know, and, and when I finally got around to saying, you know, I want to stay another week, they said, you're going to pack your things at the end of this week, and come home with us, we're not raising a spoiled brat. What do you think God feels about the way we take and take and take, but never go beyond the gift to the giver? God wants us to have all we need, but God knows that what we need most is God. And God wants us to go through the gifts to the giver. God is the only one who will satisfy the longings of our heart. God is the one who we've been looking for. And God is always hiding in plain sight, waiting for us to seek so that we will see. The church in America is in some trouble, did you know? We have beautiful buildings, and we've thought of ourselves as being in charge, kind of, of the culture. And we settled down by settling down rather than settling up. We've judged our success by the puny standards of the world and we're waking up to see that we aren't being admired or deferred to the way we once were. And in response, we, are see, we see the church appealing to politicians to save our place of privilege. Bad move. See, the church's job is to point the world to God, not to get God to motivate the world to be pointed to us. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was a powerful voice for justice in the civil rights era, but he never missed a chance to remind us of what we miss when we settle for lesser things. When the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, the message becomes meaningless. Meaning is what Isaiah is calling us to. It's what we all want. And if you still haven't found what you're looking for, Seek. Seek with all your heart. Seek, and you will see. Amen.